Uh, reading this morning from the Epistle of Paul to the Philippians in chapter 4. Philippians and chapter 4. Let's hear the word of God. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Syntyche, that to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, For I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well in that you've shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Taking us a text this morning, Romans chapter 15 and verse 33. Romans 15, verse 33, where the Apostle Paul says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The God of peace be with you all. Let me just remind you that uh, we've been looking these past uh, weeks and months at the character and the attributes of God, and that we're not engaged in a merely theological exercise as we do that, uh, but we want to know God, and it's our, our longing that the true and living God should pity us and pardon our sins and make himself known amongst us to our minds, to our affections. I want you all to know God, because our Saviour tells us this is eternal life. Now this morning we're going to consider then the peace of God from this text in Romans 15, 33. The God of peace be with you all. And you can see straight away from the context that the the Bible has a very distinct approach to peace with God. Uh, And the, the Christian, the way in which the Christian knows peace with God. Just four verses earlier in verse 30, the Apostle Paul exhorts the congregation there in Rome uh, to join him in his struggle by praying to God for him. Fight with me, he's saying. Stand in the battle alongside me, he says. 
prayer was a struggle for the Apostle Paul. And the Christian life is a call to a fight, to warfare. God is a God of peace, and he gives us his peace. But uh, the Christian life is also a life of conflict and a struggle, uh, which will be evident in a life of prayer. So when the Bible speaks of peace, it's not speaking about the false peace that people seek through various techniques, meditation and so on, through some sort of cryptic Buddhist chanting. Uh, the Bible tells us that the world is groaning in travail and, and pain. The God of this world, it tells us, is blinding the eyes of those who do not believe. And so we stand in conflict with the world and its various ways of seeking peace. It's being justified by faith that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ alone, through him, his person, and his, his work. But that call to peace with God is also a call to war. The scripture urges us every day to uh, put on, to equip ourselves with the armor of God. We fight against principalities and powers, the Bible says. And so when we come into a life of peace, peace with God, that gift of peace doesn't make us indifferent to the pain of others around us and in ourselves. Rather, we have to know, the Bible says, the fellowship of Christ's suffering. That is, the fellow feeling of those who suffer because of Christ throughout, throughout our lives as Christians. The world lives under the influence of the God of this world, a merciless enemy who seeks to devour us, the Bible says. He would destroy Christians. The gates of hell would swallow up Christians, if they could. And so we look to God, God who is the God of peace, the God who gives peace, but that peace is always given on God's terms and not ours. It is a peace. Uh, nevertheless, though we have that peace, it's a peace in which we need to watch. It's a peace in which we need to pray and to equip ourselves as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of God, then, is not some inner feeling. It's an objective reality. We can know the peace of God and yet have turmoil within us. Uh, you can use various techniques to achieve an inner state of, trans, uh, uh, of tranquility. But it's a great mistake to call a sense of inner tranquility the peace of God. Being in a calm, laid-back state about life is no indication that there's peace between you and God. You could be the most laid-back person in the world, seemingly having no worries, not, not a care in the world, and yet be at war with God. God's peace is something different. It's not a subjective feeling. It is an objective reality. God creating everything out of nothing is a reality. We see the world around us, and in the world we see the mountains, the sea, the sky, and all living things as a creation of God. And I see those things and I say to myself, God made that. God made them. I hold in my hand here, every Lord's Day, a book. It is the Word of God. I can touch it. I can weigh it. I can turn its pages. I can read the book. Holy Scripture is a reality. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a reality. A, a fellow Christian is a reality. A fellow child of God, an adopted child of God. I'm part of the church. I'm a congregation of redeemed, uh, in the congregation of a redeemed people, men and women. A reality. The body of Christ is a physical and spiritual reality occupying time and space. And the peace of God is a reality just the same. It's not a cool, cozy kind of feeling but something objective and real and substantial. So this morning we begin with this. Uh, firstly, that God uh, is the God of peace in his very being. God is the God of peace in his very being. It's a wonderful concept that God is a God of peace. We've already thought about the immensity of God and the fact that God is infinite and eternal and unchanging. He has no limit. He has no boundary. 
it is something that finite creatures such as us find very difficult, if not impossible, to properly conceive and comprehend. And you'll appreciate then the difficulty that that causes when it comes to our thinking about God and expressing the truth about God. We speak of infinity. We have no way of comprehending infinity. We speak of things eternal, but we have no way of comprehending what eternal means and what it actually is without beginning and without end. We all have a beginning. We all have an end. And to comprehend something different from our own existence and experience then is very difficult. So you'll understand what I mean when I say uh, what I'm going to say. That as we begin to delve into God, you find that he is peace. And as you go deeper and deeper into God, and you go in and in and in and in and in, all you ever find is peace. God is peace. In other words, there are no neuroses in God, no obsessive fears in the being of God. There's no phobias in God, no distracting anxiety in the heart of God, no gnawing tensions in God. There's peace right down to the profoundest depths of the heart and mind of God. Peace all the way in, peace all the way out. All the way through the being of God, nothing but peace. There's not a speck of discontent, not a trace of frustration hidden away in the corner of the mind of God, but an all-pervasive, immeasurable peace through and through. And heaven is a world of peace. There's not one resentful angel in heaven feeling sorry for himself and complaining to God. There's no discontent there. There is total love between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Uh, the Son never grumbles about the Father to the Holy Spirit. The Father never tells the, the, the Son that the Spirit is too touchy-feely. Uh, the Spirit never complains that the Father's overbearing and bossy. Uh, there is a loving harmony, harmony. There is a joyful admiration between the members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There is peace. There's utter peace between them. And that peace flows out from God through all heaven. And it embraces every angel and the spirits of just men made perfect before the throne of God. The peace of God reigns comprehensively in heaven. He is the blessed one, completely integrated in himself, totally fulfilled, happily unified. Not an envious thought exists, not an envious thought can exist in heaven. There are no grumbles, there is no animosity, no resentment, but peace fills the very heaven of heavens. God is there, and so there must be peace and so we can say of, of God, the Father, God the Father, is the God of peace. He saw Satan in the garden, tempting our first parents. He saw them fall, Adam and Eve, and discord breaking out in the paradise of Eden. He heard the man blaming the woman, and the woman saying to him, uh, but it was the serpent, blaming the serpent. And soon after they were out of the garden, it wasn't long, was it, before their son became a murderer. He killed his brother, and there was violence and discord and rebellion spreading throughout the world. But the God of peace acted, and he planned the covenant of peace. He was going to bring rebels to kneel at his feet, and in so doing, ultimately, he would make peace not only between them and him, but between those, one another, there would be peace. And he'd do that through the plan of redemption. He'd accomplish it all himself through his Son. And we can say the Son is the Prince of Peace. God the Son is the Prince of Peace. That was one of the four great titles, wasn't it, that uh, Isaiah the prophet uh, said would be his. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He makes peace between men and God. He reconciles a sin-hating God with a sin-loving people. Uh, he brings them together through 
the death of Jesus, the Lamb of God. He is our peace. He's the one who says to me, uh, to us, come to me, I will give you rest. I'll give you peace. Peace is the blessing he's pleased to give to everyone who trusts him. And we can say of God, the Holy Spirit is the God of peace. You remember how we're told in the very beginning that earth, the earth was pitch black and formless. And it was a world then of utter chaos at the very beginning. But the Holy Spirit was there moving on the face of the waters uh, in the darkness and in and with the Father. He worked step by step to transform that dark chaos into a world of order. And that same peace of God is his gift to men. That's why the angry, bitter heart of Saul of Tarsus could be transformed because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of peace. The Holy Spirit came and created in the heart of Saul understanding and enlightenment and trust in Jesus Christ's forgiveness and repentance for the awful things that Saul had done. The Holy Spirit did that. The God of peace can come right into the turmoil turmoil of our hearts, your divided heart, your divided mind, and he can make himself at home there. He can abide there. And it can be troubling to think that the Holy Spirit has access to our thoughts, uh, that he can hear the things that we say, that he sees the things that we think, all our emotions, all our desires, open to his observation. It's troubling to know, isn't it, that the Holy Spirit sees those things in us close up. The things you think about, the things you look at, uh, hearing and watching everything in your inner life to which the observation of everybody else is shut off. And you might long, as I do sometimes, that uh, he'd forget some of the things he sees. But the Holy Spirit comes to stay. He abides in us and is with us. And he pours, as it were, his oil on our troubled waters. We couldn't survive without him, without his ministry of mercy and peace to us. That's the privilege of the Christian faith. The peace of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So God in his being, his very being, as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, is the God of peace. And that God created a world of peace. That's the second point. At one point, one moment in the past, God began his work of creation. God spoke into the silence of nothingness and said, Let there be. And there was light and a world was created. We have that uh, lovely phrase in one of our hymns, don't we? Immortal, invisible God, only wise, that describes God as silent as light. He didn't need to make a commotion. He didn't need to make a big fuss when he made the universe. And even though now it's a fallen cosmos, we see the marks of God's peace everywhere, still in it, in things of beauty and things of good report. The things that make us stop and say, well, look at that. God is sustaining the whole cosmos moment by moment by his power. It lives, it moves, and has its being in him and in his peace. Think of Eden, the Garden of Eden, where we see God and man walking together in the cool of the evening, we're told, a scene of harmony and delight. Peace throughout Eden. Satan brought that to an end, brought in alienation, conflict, bloodshed into the world. What pain we see through Adam's fall. But God determined to redeem that and to reverse that. So it wasn't Adam who went searching for God, saying, God, where are you? But it is God who came looking for the hidden Adam and Eve. God setting out to redeem and to reconcile, to establish peace between men and God. And that's the third thing. God has made peace between God and men. The Son of God has done that. We understand the absence of peace, don't we? In our hearts and in the world, when we see the way in which we behave, when we do the things we do, 
when we think as we do. Think of a, a row in the family, a little row at home. And the children misbehave, and one of them says something terrible to his mam, and immediately there's tension in the house. So mam goes and busies herself in the kitchen, and uh, there's an obvious sense of alienation in the whole house until there's an apology and sorrow and forgiveness. Or a husband and a wife have a row, and they go off into their different rooms on a human level, uh, the peace of a household can be shattered. And it must be if there's love in a home. And that's how it is, you see, between God and us. Do you remember these words? But the thing which David did displeased the Lord. David took another man's wife, had her husband killed. God was not at peace with David for living like that. Peter cursing before a teenage girl for three on three occasions. I never knew the man. God didn't smile on that like some senile old man. God is just and righteous in everything he does, and his wrath is revealed from heaven against behavior like David's and like Peter's. So how can such, such a specific divine outrage for sins like that be removed? For your sins and mine, how is it removed? I'll go and do it, says the Son of God. I'll propitiate that sin. I'll take their guilt. I'll take the blame. I'll substitute myself for them and suffer the judgment they deserve. That's how peace is brought between men and God. The Son of God becoming the Lamb of God. And receiving the condemnation of our sins as he lays down his life for us. That's the meaning of the death of the Lord Jesus on Calvary. Atonement was made and peace with God has been established by Jesus' free and loving sacrifice on our behalf as our substitute. Our God is reconciled and in that reconciliation he receives us as we go to him and put our trust in him. Forgive me, we say, for Jesus' sake. And being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we can look again into God's smiling face, smiling forever at us, having become our eternal Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it's well with our souls, forever, well with our souls. The apostles knew that there were times when it would seem incredible to the Christians there at Rome, uh, that they would have peace with God. And being a pastor, uh, he recognized that in uh, writing to them and speaking to them, they would have this problem, thinking about the peace of God. And so he urged them and encouraged them to believe. Trust him, he says. Go with boldness to the throne of grace and speak to him, and you'll find mercy, and you'll find grace to help you in the time of need. Don't let a sense of guilt keep you away from him. Don't let the accusations of Satan keep you away from God. All is well between heaven and you. Jesus has died and there is peace between you and God. Believe that. Believe that. The fourth thing is that God preserves peace with himself. He preserves the peace. Uh, Paul writes, you remember, about that peace that surpasses all understanding. That is the peace that God gives to us. Remember the Lord Jesus speaking to uh, his distraught disciples on that night when he told them that he was going away, he would have to leave them, and then he says, my peace I give to you. The Lord giving his own peace to us. So Christians don't work up a sense of peace by singing. It's not through endless singing of songs and hymns or psalms or anything else that will bring peace to us. It's the gift of the fullness of his divine peace that every one of God's people receives. His people number more than the sand of the sea, the Bible says. Can there be peace for all of them? Yes, because they're not an infinite number, but God's peace is infinite. So when he has given and given and given and given, 
his peace to every one of his people, still there is a vast reservoir, an immeasurable peace to give. It is inexhaustible. It is superabundant peace. That's what God gives to his people. So you take your worries to God, those things you find so unmanageable in life, so uncontrollable and unpredictable and destructive. You take those to God and you make your request to him, says the Apostle Paul. You cast your cares on him and he accepts them. He takes on board all of your cares. He takes total responsibility for them and in place of them he gives you peace. His own peace. It seems incredible, uh, doesn't it, that that should be so? Uh, and so much so that I know that you struggle to believe it sometimes, perhaps many times. But he's actually caught all the cares that you've thrown on him uh, because the Prince of Peace cares for you, the Bible says. So Paul is an apostle of the Lord Jesus. His words are spirit-inspired words. And his word tells us that God's peace is at home in us and on us as God takes away from us our worries and our cares as we cast them on them and uh, upon him. And then thereafter, he keeps our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. God keeps your heart. God keeps your mind. An undivided mind. It's it's a gift of God. He does it. We're told that this peace is strong. It is, it's mighty to resist every threat. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul describes the, the peace of God as peace that is indescribable, surpassing all understanding. It's actually keeping us day by day. The analogy there in Philippians is that of a sentry, of a security guard, on duty, a bodyguard with a single aim to keep us, to guard us. That's what the peace of God is doing. God's sentry of peace at attention and on watch. Halt who goes there. What gives you the right to come in here disturbing the peace? And they drive away the, car uh, the conflict, the carriers of conflict. And uh, they do their, that, says Paul, in Christ Jesus. So there's really no secret about the source of this blessing. No secret about the preservation of divine peace. It comes through union with Christ. It's one of the guaranteed consequences of being united to him, joined to him. The hosts of the Lord encamp around us and guard us. Elisha's servant, you remember, lost all peace when he saw the army of Syria surrounding the house where he and Elisha were, and Elisha prays that God would open his servant's eyes, and God does, and Gehazi, the servant, saw another mightier hosts, the armies and the chariots of heaven camping around Elisha and Gehazi, uh, coming between them and their enemies, so that they were absolutely safe. There was no need for fear. They could be at peace. That's what God's peaceful armies do. They protect the life and peace that God has given to his people. And it is his peace that is within us, his peace that surrounds us, his peace that protects us. Walls of salvation surround the souls he delights to defend. That's the grace of God. And he's taking us to a future of peace. The next great event in God's redemptive calendar is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he promised. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be with me where I am. The Prince of Peace tells us he's coming again. He's going to establish a reign of peace. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more war memorials and Remembrance Sundays. Uh, men are going to beat their swords into plowshares. Every impenitent assassin, every impenitent, unrepentant suicide bomber will be in the pit and the stains of blood will be washed off from the earth. The lion will lie down with the lamb, says the scripture. The child will put his 
hand upon the scorpion's nest and be unharmed, there will be a day, says the Bible, when not a single man who breathes the air of the new heavens and the new earth will hate his neighbour. Everyone will say to the other, my brother. There'll be peace. The Lord Jesus Christ will be the Prince of Peace, reigning over a world of peace and glory. And that's a living hope because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He was killed. He was pronounced officially dead. But the third day, the grave could not hold him. He showed himself more powerful than death. And he came forth with the keys of death and hell, the Bible says. And he has opened for us the door of heaven. And heaven is a world of peace. A world of peace because those who cause pain and strife will not be there. Revelation 21 verse 7. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars will never disturb our peace again. They'll be absent from heaven. And what of those things that destroy our peace? Revelation 21 verse 4. There'll be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things will have passed away. What about our grief? God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will do that. With the infinite tenderness and kindness that is his. God of love drying one eye after another. No dull heartaches in heaven. Nothing that disturbs the peace or makes us afraid or anxious or depressed will be there. And then notice the present benediction. Paul knew these Christians at Rome. He knew about them. He knew their leaders. He knew how big the congregation was and the sort of questions the Christians there were asking and the tensions that existed in the church. And his great desire for them there in our text is the God of peace be with you all. Amen. He longed that that would be the real experience of the leaders, but not only the leaders, but of the children too, of the slaves, but also for the free men, for the beggars, but also for those who were living in Caesar's household, for the men who were legionnaires and centurions in the imperial army of Rome, uh, for the old men and women who dragged themselves along to church on a stick. May they all know the presence of the God of peace, says Paul, on the Lord's day, on every other day, in hours of darkness and hours of light, when their best friend is taken away from them, when they're all alone, when they face an unknown future, the God of peace be with you all, he says. What do we have in the years that lie ahead of us if that isn't our blessing? God being with us, this God, the God of peace, the God that we shall all soon meet, the God who will meet his people with grace and peace, keeping our hearts and minds from despair. We've seen, haven't we, our sins. We've felt our guilt. If we're Christians, you can't be a Christian without acknowledging sin and guilt. And we've run to God because we want him. We know we can't face the future without him. Whom do we have in heaven but him? We've pleaded in Jesus Christ that he should save us, and he has. And the Prince of Peace has become our peace, and through faith in him, uh, God is ours. The estrangement, the condemnation that we deserve because of our sins is removed because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, freely took that condemnation. And so peace like a river attends my way, and it is well with my soul, we say. Uh, Charles Spurgeon talks about a Roman poet called Petrarch who said that there were five great enemies to peace, and Spurgeon changed one of them. He removed uh, the word avarice, and he put in its place the word error. Error, he said, is the first enemy of peace, enemy, an enemy entering the church, spoken by men with smiling faces, sparkling eyes, gentle sincerity, 
They claim the new light they've had and new experiences and new liberty because of it. But they're actually telling us old errors that will bind us with ancient chains. There'll never be peace in places, in congregations, where the great cardinal truths of the Christian faith are not affirmed. The peace of God will reign only in a church that is at peace with the Bible. Error will destroy it. The next enemy, he says, is ambition. Ambition. The promotion, a big wage, the new position of influence enjoyed, uh, the respect, the rank that comes uh, with a new title, and it swells the head and it swells the heart and it tempts people to be bold, to stand in judgment over pulpits and over churches. That's a sure way to say goodbye to peace. And anger. Anger is the third enemy of peace. Men who quickly fall into sulking and who grumble about one thing and another all the time. Men and women, who you've got to handle them with kid gloves because they're so touchy. They're so quick to take offence. How little they know of the peace of God. Do you remember how Joseph, when his brothers were sent back to Egypt to fetch Jacob, he said to them, now you beware that you don't fall out along the way. That's what anger does. And so he says, keep together now. Stand by one another. Defend each other's character. Love one another. Remember, we're all going to live together forever. The fourth enemy of peace is envy. Let's pray that the God of peace will kill that green-eyed monster in us before it raises its head in a congregation. And pride. Pride. Either the God of peace is going to kill our pride... Or our pride will destroy the influence of peace and the prince of peace in our life. There's a great word in this letter to the Romans in chapter 12 and verse 16. It says, do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. He's speaking about people with learning difficulties. He's speaking about little children and simple poor people. Elderly folk who love God, our brothers and sisters forever. Shan't we love them with whom God's peace dwells? Be at peace with one another, says the scripture. May the God of peace be with you. And may all error and ambition and anger and envy and pride not be tolerated amongst us for one moment as a congregation. Only God, God alone, the God of peace, reigning in us and over us, so that this place might be called a house of the God of peace only. Amen. Lord bless his word to us.